All right, America is not Babylon, moment number two. We're going to talk about Oliver Cromwell, a great Bible-believing Christian who openly fought against Roman Catholics. And I do mean fought physically with sword and gun and whatever else they had back then. And you say, well, why would he do a thing like that? Well, let me show you. Here I have uh, this book, Smoke Screens. Who is the Horror of Revelation? A Biblical and Historical Answer. Very good book. Here we have, I'll zoom in a little bit better. On August 22nd, 1572, the bloody St. Bartholomew Massacre began. This was to be one fatal blow to destroy the Protestant movement in France. The King of France had cleverly arranged a marriage between his sister and Admiral Coligny, the chief Protestant leader. There was a great feast with much celebrating. After four days of feasting, the soldiers were given a signal. At 12 o'clock midnight, all the houses of the Protestants in the city were forced open at once. The admiral was killed, his body thrown out a window into the street where his head was cut off and sent to the Pope. They also cut off his arms and privates and dragged him through the streets for three days until they finally hung his body by the heels outside the city. They also slaughtered many other well-known Protestants. In the first three days, uh, over 10,000 were killed. The bodies were thrown into the river and blood ran through the streets. There's a picture of it. A drawing, I should say. Blood ran through the streets, uh, or blood ran in the river until it appeared like a stream of blood. So furious was their hellish rage that they even slew their own followers if they suspected that they were not very strong in their belief in the Pope. From Paris, the destruction spread to all parts of the country. Over 8,000 people, more people were killed. Very few Protestants escaped the fury of their persecutors. A similar massacre occurred in Ireland in 1641. The conspirators picked October 23rd, 23rd, excuse me, 23rd, the feast of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. They planned a general uprising for the whole country. All Protestants would be killed at once. To throw them off guard when the, while the plan was being made, extra acts of kindness were shown to the Protestants. Look out for that. Early in the morning, the conspirators were armed and every Protestant that they could find was immediately murdered. They showed no mercy. From children to the aged, they were killed. Even in invalids were not spared. They were caught by complete surprise. They had lived in peace and safety for years and now found no place to run. They were massacred by neighbors, friends, and even relatives. And there you have it. And they would do far more worse things. They'd string women up like that and cut their breasts off and things. And they'd, you know, take uh, spikes and things and they would whip people. And, and it just, it was disgusting. And you see... This thing has gone on and on and on by the Catholics for centuries. And by the way, if you think it can't happen in America, it can easily happen in America. You say, where are the Catholic armies? Well, they're all over the place. Knights of Columbus, the Jesuits, all these different Catholic organizations, the Masonic Lodges, all of them under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church or, you know, the Vatican. Not the Jews in New York City or America, the Babylon or some kind of foolish nonsense. All right, but I'm going to read a couple of quotes from this book, The Greatness of Oliver Cromwell. You see, Cromwell was born in this time period. So Cromwell was not deceived into thinking, all oh, the Catholics are our friends. They're just another Christian church that we can agree to disagree with. <laughs> no, no. He knew the danger of Roman Catholics. That's why he fought openly against them. It was a matter of survival. Let me just show you a couple of things here about Oliver Cromwell. Page 45, we have the authorized version of the Bible had been completed in 1611 when Oliver was 12 and was read by him both at school and at home. How thoroughly he knew the authorized version in the Psalms is attested by all his later speeches. Oliver feared God, but not man. Okay, you can read this little quote by him there. But the fact is, Oliver Cromwell never lost one battle while he was in command. And he is the only, only one of, I think, three men that ever did that. Joshua never lost a battle when he was in command. David, King David in the Bible, and Oliver Cromwell. Interesting. Uh, let's see here. Speaking of Cromwell, it says, he says here, uh, Whosoever would not or would have gone about to heal Babylon, 
when God was determined to destroy her, he does fight against God because God will not have her healed. What's he talking about there? Well, um, Oliver Cromwell here is talking about the United Nations. Okay, The United Nations there in New York City, because that's Babylon, run by the Jews. All right. I mean, Oliver said this, I think it was right around uh, 1648 is when he, when he said this quote here. So he was talking about the United Nations because, see, that's Babylon. <laughs> no, he was talking about Roman Catholicism. Okay, he knew who it was. See, back in his day, they were just starting to come out of the thing of the Vatican controlling all the kings of the earth, totally controlling them. And they still do, by the way, too. Uh, if you think that there would be an anti Vatican anti Jesuit president, um, and you say, well, maybe he could get elected to the United States Office of President or something. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Anybody that's running for president is in the back pocket of the Vatican, including old Donald Trump that a lot of you endorse, because he's a better option than Hillary Clinton. That's like saying, what's a better option? Uh, you know, uh, Playboy or Hustler or something like this. I mean, no, you go with the Bible. You stick with the Bible. Donald Trump is Jesuit trained. And Hillary Clinton is also in bed with the Vatican. They're not giving us any choices. So as a Christian, you say, neither. I don't think so. But why would Cromwell point to Babylon being the Roman Catholic Church? Because he lived, he knew. Uh, let's see here. Page 360, right there he says, It is true that as a young man he had spoken angrily of the Roman Catholics and Anglicans, but as he grew older he became more and, and not less tolerant. He regarded the popery of the Spaniards and Irish as primarily a political religion, as a flaming sword poised to destroy freedom of worship throughout the world. It's exactly what they're about. Com Cromwell was never afraid of ideas. He believed that the truth would prevail. That was why he thought it was an unjust and unwise jealousy to deprive a man of his natural liberty upon a supposition that he might abuse it. When he did abuse it, it was a time to judge. Okay, so Cromwell was not this evil, you know, bigoted guy that just hated Catholics and whatever else. He would leave Catholics alone if they left people alone. He'd allow them to worship in secret, you know. He wasn't just about there, you know, let's just kill every single buddy that, that calls themselves Catholic. He was only going after the ones that were doing this kind of stuff over here that's described in smoke screens. That's who he went after. And by the way, I should also add that when Oliver Cromwell died, his son Richard took over for a little while. Oliver Cromwell had been, if you don't know the story of the English Civil War, basically King Charles, King James, who our Bible was nicknamed after, our authorized version, originally called that, then now it's nicknamed the King James Version. That's what most people call it. I call it that myself. No big deal. But King James had a son, Charles. Charles became king. When King James was alive, he said, no, no future king or queen can be a Roman Catholic. King Charles marries a Roman Catholic princess. Nice. So now he's got a Roman Catholic wife. And of course, she's pulling the strings, really, what's going on there. Very feministic, very domineering woman, which Roman Catholic women are. And so you got this Roman Catholic queen, she's pulling the strings, and Charles I starts to go against the, the English people. He starts to, to trample over their, their rights and things. Um, a lot of, it's a big story. I don't want to get into all the, the whole thing. But shuts Parliament down, and the members of Parliament start a war against the royalists, those that support the king. And the king is getting aid from the Roman Catholic Church. And he's trying to bring Roman Catholic troops in. Well, thankfully, uh, the members of Parliament defeat the king on the battlefield, many, many different battles. They defeat them, and they take the king, put him on trial, and the king refuses to, uh, you know, uh, repent of being in bed with the Catholics, like the Bible says in Revelation 17, you know. And uh, he ref refuses, so they behead him. And meanwhile, his son Charles II, the king's son, has fled to France with his mother, back to her family. And uh, so Oliver Cromwell is installed. He does not take the title of king, because his famous quote was, Christ and not man is king. 
So Cromwell refuses to be called king, but he's put in as the Lord Protector. And under Crom or under yeah under Cromwell, England becomes a major power, and they go out and they're basically just pushing Catholics out and saying get out of here, and they're going into Ireland, driving them out of there and things. And I mean the the Catholic crowned heads of France and Spain and things, they're scared to death of Oliver Cromwell and his forces because they're not losing any battles. And um, very, very fascinating story. There's a movie out that uh, uh, Richard Harris is the guy that plays Cromwell. It was made back in the 70s, I think. And um, and it seems like a pretty good mu movie. It's it's not really accurate totally to the, to the facts. I, I would recommend this book here. Um, again, The Greatness of Oliver Cromwell by Morris Ashley. Um, this is a pretty good book from some of the stuff I've read. But uh, the movie, eh, you know, it, I mean, the, the Richard Harris is a Jesuit. I mean, you know, trained, uh, trained at a Jesuit university, I'll say it that way, as an actor, you know. And so it's kind of weird to have an, a Jesuit trained actor playing Oliver Cromwell. Strange. But uh, what happened is Oliver Cromwell dies and um, some suspected foul play there. Uh, that he was sick and he wasn't given the proper care. We won't go into that. But his son Richard takes over in his stead. Well, King Charles II comes in, um, comes back to England and raises up the royalists again. They overthrow uh, Richard, kick him out of there. And they restore Charles II to his position on the throne. Uh, well, not restore. They put him in the throne there. And uh, one of the first things he does... He digs up Oliver Cromwell's dead corpse, the corpse of Oliver Cromwell, and beheads it. These are sick individuals we're talking about here, these Roman Catholics. And uh, you also might want to check into some of the things about Charles II and his court uh, practicing um, magical ceremonies by eating dead body parts. I'm not joking. They did that. They believed it was powerful and good for your health and things like this. And there was also all kinds of perversion. you know. And it's interesting too because that's really, if you want to date it back, that's really when uh, some of the immodest apparel really started to come in as well under Charles II. The uh, Roman Catholic, you know, not a Zionist Jew, you know. This is when your Bible talks about uh, them killing the saints and martyrs of Jesus. It's the Roman Catholics, not the United Nations run by Jews or something. Don't fall for the lies of these Vatican devils out there that are trying to cover up for their master, the Roman Catholic Church.